Hi, I'm Maria Vitaniemi from the Clean Energy Institute at the University of Washington. I work in Professor Kai Mei Fu's lab in the physics department. Today I'm going to be showing you how to align a typical confocal microscope. I'm going to be demonstrating on a microscope that I already have built in my lab. For this reason, it's important to pay attention to when I say things are essential for a confocal microscope, when things are useful for alignment, and when things are particular to my microscope. Also, whenever you're aligning a confocal microscope, it's very important to be safe and to have your, your, the correct safety goggles. In my setup, here is where my excitation laser begins. The, path, the beam path goes along here through two alignment mirrors and then continues along this path to my sample and my objective. Once, once, it, once the sample is excited, it will emit light that gets, then gets transli translated along the collection path. The collection path includes two lenses and a pinhole. Then the beam passes through two useful mirrors, and then a mirror and a lens, getting all the way to my alignment camera. The first step in aligning a confocal microscope is to collimate your laser beam. Oftentimes, if it's coming out of a fiber, it'll be expanding. So we need an aspherical lens to collimate the beam. See the references below for a tutorial on how to choose a collimating lens. Once you've chosen your lens and place it about a focal length away from your laser beam, you will then have to make sure to carefully center the beam and then to have it the, exactly one focal length away from the, from the entrance of your fiber. To do this, we can use either a handy card or a right angle ruler with some white tape on it so we can see our beam. You know a beam is collimated when when you look at the beam close to the laser and far away it is this it's the same diameter. You want to make sure that it's collimated for what's very long compared to your entire system. So right now this isn't quite far enough away. Typically I would use a kind of an old mirror like this to send the beam somewhere to infinity. It's important when you, place, when you place the mirror in that you always tilt it down first before you know where the beam is going so as not to hit anyone in the eye. And you can send it to, inf to infinity and have your friend go far away and make sure that the beam is still the same size it was at the entrance pupil. In order to adjust the, uh, the collimation, you'll rotate this, a knob like this that changes the, the, uh, the location of the lens. Once you have your beam collimated, we're then going to set up two alignment mirrors. I'm going to show you first how to roughly align them to make it find, find adjustments easier later. First, we want to make sure that our beam is roughly centered on the face of our alignment mirror. Then, we're going to adjust this mirror so the beam is going along this line of holes. We're going to do this by using, again, our handy right angle ruler. So here, the edge, the edge of the beam should, be, should match the edge of the ruler when the ruler is on, on, along this line of holes. So I will choose two locations, one close to the mirror and one a little bit further away. And I will first twist the mirror back and forth like so until the beam is roughly on the edge of the ruler. I then move the ruler closer and translate the beam in the, in the direction perpendicular to the mirror, forward and back here, until it's roughly again on the edge of the ruler. And then I go back and iterate this process. Every now and then, checking to make sure that my beam is still centered on the face of this mirror. Once I've found a position I like, I then clamp down my mirror so that it'll, so I don't accidentally bump it. Sometimes the beam will move when you do this, so make sure you're paying attention that it doesn't, doesn't leave your system. Once I've set up the first mirror, I then repeat the same process for the second mirror, this time making sure it goes along this line of holes. I choose two locations, here and maybe out there, to make sure that I can, to make sure I, I can know how to twist it 
and how to translate it. And then if it's not hitting the center of this mirror, I can also translate my mirror in the direction parallel to the mirror face without adjusting my alignment. Right. Now that we have our two alignment mirrors roughly aligned and the beam is going along this row of holes, we set up our two irises. I've made sure that the irises are at the height that I want and are centered along this row of holes. Now I want to make sure that my beam is going directly through these two by using the fine adjustments on these two alignment mirrors. I begin by, by checking where the beam is relative to the first iris. When I, when I, I can do this, by either looking at the beam after the iris and seeing when I close the iris down where, whether it closes centered on the beam or not. I can also look directly on this side of the iris if I can see my beam on my iris. It is sometimes difficult to do if you have near infrared beams or beams that are not easy to see on black. So I begin by using the horizontal adjustment knob, knob to adjust the tilt of my mirror so that it so that is centered so the beam is centered on the iris i can move it left or right and now you so now if i have it too far off when i close the iris you can see that it closes first on one side before it closes on the other but if it's well centered it will close uniformly around the beam. Then, I go to my second mirror and my second iris. I do the same procedure again. I close the beam and see if it's going directly through the iris. And I adjust the horizontal tilt of this mirror to get it going directly centered through the iris. I have to then iterate this process many times until my beam is centered nicely through both irises. Once it's horizontally aligned, I then again repeat the process, making sure that the beam is aligned in the, ver in the vertical direction. Again, using the first mirror to adjust for the first iris and the second mirror to adjust for the second iris. Once my beam is going directly through the irises, I now know that I can put my beam back to exactly where it was even if something gets bumped or if something drifts. Once you have your two irises set up and your beam going directly through them, you then have to get your, your beam to your sample and through your objective. Here is my objective and down there is my sample. If you, it's important that you have a way to get your beam centered onto the back of the objective and going straight through the objective. It also needs to be able to be close enough to your sample uh, so that's about one working distance of your objective away. This can be difficult and your alignment procedure will be different for every particular setup. Once, once your beam is going to your sample, your sample will then oftentimes emit or reflect light. This is what you're going to be collecting and it's going to come out roughly collimated from your objective and straight. It's then important to have a filter that will remove your excitation beam, but allow your PL to get to your collection path, which for me is along this way. Once you have your beam going to your sample, you, and, you're, and you have light coming out that you're collecting, we then have to set, send our collected light along our collection path. We again use the different alignment procedures we talked about earlier, either with one mirror or with two alignment mirrors. For space reasons, I only have one mirror in this case, which makes alignment much more difficult than if I had two. So I've already finely adjusted both the position along the plane perpendicular and twisted it to get my beam going roughly along this line of holes. Then, once again, I set up two irises and make sure that the beam is going directly through the center of these two irises. Now, we have to put in our two lenses in our pinhole. We want to make sure that the lenses will be roughly um, a focal, the first lens will be roughly a focal length away from the pinhole, and the second lens will also be roughly its focal length away from the pinhole. 
then there are two ways to do this process, which I will now describe. The first method is quick, but not nearly as precise as the second method I'll show you. In this method, we begin first by putting in our lens, um, making sure we have the flat side to the focus, and then this, this beam is now focusing down our collimated beam to, and it will be focused at the focal plane. We'll then put in our pinhole roughly in the center of the beam at roughly the focal length away. It's easiest to place the pinhole if you have a micrometer stage. It is almost you, it's almost always essential to also have a flip mount for your pinhole. In this down and dirty method, we'll then use a power meter after our pinhole to measure the recorded power. We'll adjust the pinhole first in the x and y direction to get to maximize the power. Once the power is maximized, we'll then translate our pinhole along the peen path just a little bit. Even something much less than a millimeter can make a significant difference. Once we choose a new location along the beam path, we then max again maximize our X and our Y of the pinhole until we get the most power. We repeat this process at many different Z lo locations along our beam path until we have found where the beam is the most focused. That will correspond to where we have the most power detected using our power meter. Then we know that our, our pinhole is located at the focus of the first lens. Once we know where the beam is focused at the first lens, we then have to collimate our beam. Uh, this, we do this by placing our second lens roughly a focal length away from our, from our pinhole. Again, we want the flat side of the lens to be facing toward where the beam is focused. This is our collimating lens. And th this will allow us to recollimate the beam so that we can send our beam to our detector wherever it is. In order to make sure this lens is in the correct location, you have to make sure the beam should be collimated. So we're lucky in the, my sample in that we can see a little bit of the beam. Maybe you can't see it on the, on the cam camera screen at home, but I can see it here. If you can't see your beam, then you just have that, then you have to be very careful and, ma and wait till you can get a detector that can see your beam in order to make sure that it's collimated. So in this second method, we gain a lot more information. So we'll have to make sure once again that our beam is going down the collection path straight. And then we have to set up a mirror that will send our beam off to our camera. In my setup, I actually have to go through three different mirrors because my beam gets split off in many, many different directions. It's often useful to have this mirror on a flip mount because you want to be able to flip into your camera, but you want to be able to also send the beam to a different detector. You usually want to have the beam you're sending to your camera be the one reflecting off of the flipping mirror. So that way, the more stable beam path is the one that goes to your detector. So we begin by sending our beam to our camera. It's going to be pretty big and pretty blurry at first. This is because our beam is collimated. So for our camera, CCD camera, it's going to be huge on the chip. So in order to be able to better focus it, once we know that our, our, once we know that our beam is going roughly centered on a camera, we do this by setting up an iris in front of our camera. We are then going to focus our beam down onto the camera chip. So again, we'll have to set up a lens approximately a focal length away from our camera. So this lens has a very long focal length. And then we will adjust the we will adjust this camera lens in the x and y direction until we can see it on our camera screen. We then have to decide where, along, where exactly along this beam path is the focus for our, for, for our beam. 
So once we know that our beam is going to our camera, we then actually block our laser beam or our collected light. So now to focus our camera to infinity and decide on the location of this lens along the beam path, we will need once again to send our camera image to infinity. I'm going to place in my large awkward mirror right here. So now my camera is looking through this lens and this mirror onto this camera. I'm going to carefully balance it here and tell my friend to go hold up a sign somewhere far in the distance, wherever my camera is recording. It's most useful to focus the camera using the wavelength of light that is most similar to the wavelength that you're trying to collect. So from, in my case, I'm trying to collect blue light. So I'm using my blue LED and my friend will shine the light onto this at infinity and I will then focus my, my, ca my camera lens onto this, um, onto this monitor at infinity. It's kind of difficult to see in this case and hard to find, but somewhere over there, you can see I shine my light toward infinity, but it's not far enough away so it's not focused. Once I've chosen the location of this lens, I then go back to looking at my beam or a beam path. And now I want to image the pinhole in a similar way. To do this, I will bring the focal plane at infinity to my pinhole. So once we have this lens place so that the camera is focused at infinity, we're going to bring our plane at infinity closer to us by placing in our second lens. So this lens has a focal length of about 100 millimeters. We place our pinhole approximately 100 millimeters away. We will then, uh, we will then clamp down this lens and adjust the position of the pinhole until we can image it on the camera. So if you look to the camera, we can now see that as I move the pinhole or the lens, the, the pinhole comes in and out of focus. We're looking to image the very front face of the pinhole. The closer the wavelength of light you use, the light you're trying to collect, the better your focus will be and the better your alignment will be. Once we've placed in our second lens, making sure that, it, it, that it's perpendicular to our beam path and we have our pinhole in the correct location, we will now place in our first focusing lens. Making sure again that the flat side is to the direction we want the beam to be focused. And if we place it just right, we can then see our beam on the camera monitor over there. In order to find the correct location, the correct location um, in the plane parallel to the lens space, we want to make sure that, this, that our laser spot, our collect collected light spot, goes back to the same place where it was before. Once we know that it's in the correct XY location, we decide its location along the path, the beam path, by trying to minimize the spot on the camera. As we move it in and out of focus, it'll be, it'll be focused in the same plane as the pinhole when the spot is the smallest. Once we've decided and have the correct location for this lens, we then clamp it down. Now we have both of our lenses and our pinhole in and we can even see our image, our beam quality on our camera. So now our, our, our focal microscope is completely aligned. We can now see our beam on our camera and we can adjust the fine details of our, of our alignment. Now what's left is to send our beam to our detector. So we do this, we oftentimes will flip down this mirror and then continue along a different path. We use the same techniques that we've used before of aligning with either one or two mirrors. Once our beam goes to our fiber or to our detector, we use a, a similar procedures, making sure that our beam gets focused using a different lens onto our fiber or onto our detector. And with this, you have completed your first confocal microscope. Thank you for watching.